Okay, we are live at the FE3 tutorial. All right. Oh, great. Thank you so okay. Okay. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, can everybody hear me? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Okay. So, uh, thanks for coming to the uh, SP3 tutorial today. Uh, SP3 stands for the uh, JSD Alignment Bind Secure Data Core. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the a uh, little bit of the history of uh, SP3 from the start of the Trunkful Transport Module back in the 90s, and uh, discuss some of the applications that we're talking about. Uh, some of the thinking that went into how uh, SP3 survived, uh, some background in uh, finite volume numerical methods, and uh, the, uh, then going to the general algorithms and structure of SP3. And then the last part, if I have uh, time, I'm going to delve into more, more practical aspects of setting the English options, test packages, and uh, so on. Uh, I just want to invite anybody that if you have uh, any questions or any comments about anything you might say, anything that's unclear, feel free to stop me and uh, ask for a question or a clarification, or just have something that pops in your head and see. Unusual or uh, unclear. Okay. So. <clears throat> By the way, I have to point out it's been 20 years since I use a Windows computer on a regular basis. Okay. Okay, so, uh, okay, so what exactly is SP3? And I can give you the, that it's a finite volume tincture in the core, but it, that, that may not necessarily mean a whole lot to everybody. Um, but what exactly does, what exactly do all these things mean? And so, SP3, SP3 is designed to be a fully finite volume, uh, in the core, and I'll get to a little bit more about what that means, but that basically it treats the atmosphere as a, block, as a series of blocks, or what we call our finite volumes. And then uses a physically motivated algorithm to compute the uh, mass, the mass, and the uh, forces between each uh, grid cell on one another. Uh, and this, uh, this takes advantage of a couple of technologies that were developed, uh, that were pioneered in uh, SP3 as predecessors. It's also mimetic, which is kind of a fancy uh, mathematical way, something that reproduces uh, physical properties that we see in the uh, real fluid systems. Uh, in particular, it recovers Newton's laws and various conservation laws from the by, uh, by uh, using integral theorems from the basic, uh, the basic governing physical principles. Uh, SP3 is very adaptable and robust. It works with many physical and chemistry packages, and that's part of the reason why it's implemented in so, many, so many different models. Uh, and it's also uh, paying for its ability to do that SP3-based models do an excellent job of uh, ocean coupling. And indeed, part of the reason why uh, this is the site SP3 is adopted at both GFEL and at NCAR is because it gave an excellent ocean plan in a very long uh, un un control uh, climate simulations. SP3 is a flexible dynamical core. Uh, it has a lot, it's a very good at using an arbitrary set of vertical levels, uh, and it's very, has a very powerful set of uh, grid assignment techniques. And the SP3 is also a fast dynamical core. Efficiency is always considered when developing, uh, at, when developing SP3. And this is important not just because it saves the, saves the user's time, running your forecast out, it also accelerates the development and finally, SP3 has been proven to be effective at all state scales, from the very course of climate simulations to convective scales. And SP3 is designed to be able to maintain the larger scale circulations while accurate representing uh, middle scale and cloud scale circulations. I'm sorry. So a little bit of history. So Singh has problems connecting to the network. Um, okay. Um, pardon me for uh, technical uh, difficulties. Um, Okay. 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 There we go. Okay. There's just a network hiccup then. Okay. Okay. So a little bit of history here. So uh, SP3 has been led through. Okay. Yeah. There's a. It's the board dial. Okay. 
Okay, I think it's addition. Okay. What about what are things with the little hatch marks? That's these. Oh, you know, yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. So great. yeah, so, so I don't know if you can minimize those at all. Yeah, I'll try to get rid of some yeah. of those. Yeah. So, but yeah, be careful that that's the recording. You don't want to. Uh, don't want to accidentally close it. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. So that's uh. So let's see here. So uh. Um, manage panels. Okay. Um, Three has been developed by SJ Wynn, originally at NASA Goddard and at, now at uh, GFDL. Uh, and originally it was developed as the uh, Lennon Road Detection Team, designed for a chemistry transport module at, no, at uh, NASA Goddard. And uh, they, well, the chemistry transport problem for these issues with phaser detection, which uh, standard standard frequency schemes tend to give you negative values, they give you overshoots and undershoots, and all those things are pretty bad for chemistry, chemistry models. Then we can get a TV chemistry model with negative values, and it blows up. And uh, what you can do with a finite volume type scheme is you can prevent any of those things from occurring. And uh, this was introduced into the chemistry transport module, and uh, the chemists in the aerosol, model, aerosol modelers are so pleased with this result that uh, it allowed them to really go a lot further with the sort of modeling they were doing. And this is the beginning of a longer, longer term uh, research initiative where they were uh, essentially to take the, uh, take the finite volume methodology and apply it to the shallow water model, a global shallow water model called the SP4. And on top, and then from beyond that, he, uh, he introduced this, uh, what's called a Lagrangian requirement. This is something that's been used theoretically for many years, but this is the first time that it had been really introduced into a numerical model and made effective. To the point where I was running, those a fully three-dimensional FD4 was running in a GS and And this FD4 is what was plugged into the, uh, NCAR CCSM, or which is now CESM. And this analytical core does such a good job, especially at uh, ocean coupling and, and efficiency, that it's 20 years later, after being introduced into the CESM, it's still a workhorse animal for the NCAR climate model. Can you explain the vertical board? Uh, I'll have a section on that a little bit later. Okay. Uh, I think uh, in uh, 20, 2003, FD was born to the uh, GFDL CM2, and the resulting model CM2.1 became the best uh, couple climate model in the world. CM2 was already a very good model, but the uh, Adding in the SD core is really the last step that made it the best in the world. This is still a model that's used uh, worldwide uh, as a very efficient model with very excellent kind of characteristics. Uh, it's a very, very, very fast model. You don't need to use supercomputer design to do long climate integrations. And then from there, uh, SJ Lynn and uh, Bill Plunkin, they put they added the 3 to SD3, which is, should be a cube, superscript, a cube, by uh, creating a cube sphere for it. And this uh, solves some of the problems that the uh, Matlon SD. I'll get into a little bit later, and was immediately adopted in the NASA GMS model and in the GCL AM3 and HIRAM models. Now, from there, uh, SA developed a non hydrostatic prototype and uh, created one of the very first uh, global convective scale models in the world. Uh, this is uh, a few years behind the effort by the uh, Japanese, which is still the world's leading uh, convective scale model, uh, it's called NICAM, uh, world's leading global convective scale model, excuse me. Uh, uh, but this is, this is, a, this is a very uh, very leading effort uh, that that uh, was done with uh, with the with the prototype uh, hydrostatic solver in SD3, and then later uh, the hydrostatic solvers continued to develop as well as uh, rigorous thermodynamics and a prototype need for introducing the uh, microphysics core. In 2016, SD3 was selected as the uh, core the core around which NCGS was built, be built. And uh, since then, there's been a lot of work in what we call the super FP3, integrating some more of the physical parameterization directly within the uh, dynamical core, creating a very consistent and efficient way of interfacing uh, physics, particularly things like subgrid uh, information in the core. 
this is the uh, SC3 team. Uh, SJ Lynn is the uh, leader here. Uh, the, uh, the team is about, uh, eight, about 19 members right now, uh, all together. Uh, a number of people working in a full variety, variety of applications. Uh, we work, there's a number of us, a couple of us who work on the SC3 and M4, but there's a lot of us who work on the applications of SC3, maybe the two, uh, different numerical models, the high RAM and the, uh, and the, uh, and what we call the FDGFS model, prototype for the uh, FD3 GFS, which is now running in parallel. Uh, we also have had a few members who have departed to different uh, institutions around the world, um, some in private industry, others in other laboratories and universities. So the, the FD3 community, FD3 is actually one of the world's most widely used global dynamical cores, and almost all the global models in the United States use FD3 in some, in, or its predecessors in some cases. To some capacity. The only exception right now is the uh, Department of Energy using the spectrum model that gets more. Uh, our, our feeling is that the community is based off a number of different models that use, that have a bunch of different purposes, but they take one day or in a adapt it to their own needs. Um, so, in MP3, FP3 is designed to be important to be transmitted from one system oh, into another. Oh, no. And then the people who receive these cores, if they have individual uh, needs that need to be solved, such as an NSEC needed to develop the uh, these develop a stochastic physics package with the ESRL, so they develop a specialized version that introduces some of the uh, stochastic physics and includes estimate of dissipated of, 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 of the numerical dissipation. So these are the models that use uh, FD3 in, as their dynamic core at uh, GFDL and uh, NASA, it's the primary uh, dynamic core for many of their needs. NCAR uses, of course, the uh, predecessor uh, FC and the lap line FE, and they're also using the FE3. In fact, I think uh, they had a call on their efforts on that right now. Uh, and, of course, it's the uh, identical core for NGPS. They're also used in the, uh, a number of different uh, university applications. There's the Harvard okay. Lab Geos Chem project that uses FD 3 as well as our partners in uh, Taiwan and in China. Uh, a couple of examples of what this uh, dynamical core is used for. This is a uh, GFDL global climate models, and here's one example of the MJL on these models. On the left-hand side, you see a uh, 100 kilometer uh, AM4. This is our flagship uh, atmosphere model for uh, IPCC class applications. And this is a plot of the uh, MJO propagation. Uh, the bottom panel is the observations of uh, about uh, 200 millibar of zonal wind speed and of uh, op observed uh, upwind long range radiation. And you can see that at 100 kilometers, you get some signal if you use the guide at the sea, but if you go to a couple atmosphere ocean model, you get a very good signal of uh, MJO propagation. So you can go beyond that. Uh, on the left here, on the right here, this is a, uh, a 25 kilometer high RAM simulation. High RAM is a simplified, this uses a version AM4 simplified aerosol physics and a more advanced uh, microphone scheme, the GFDL microphone And in that, that does a very good job of simulating the science loss of care system for our team. And in particular, this is the first model that could reproduce the observed relationship between the phases of the NJO and tropical cyclones in the Caribbean and in the Atlantic, which really opens up the way towards uh, some seasonal prediction of hurricane, of uh, tropical cyclone formation in this region, particularly once you have a good simulation of NJO. Uh, of more immediate interest, these are the systems that we run in real time when you do model FDGFS. This is the FD3 core coupled to uh, the GFS uh, physics. And uh, here's a couple of different uh, applications. One is our uh, global, global 13 kilometer model. We're going at four times daily. Uh, here's a forecast from uh, this morning. This initialized at 16. Uh, you can see that it may not be so good for uh, North Carolina. But this is one example of what we're doing in real time. We also have a couple of different systems that run at very high resolutions using your nested grid. Uh, one is the HSC GFS, which uses a three kilometer grid, a nested grid over the Tropical Atlantic that's running four times daily in real time right now. Uh, this is a uh, wind forecast for uh, for, uh, uh, for for the hurricane. And uh, we also run a, a few kilometer nested that uh, we call CFD GFS, so the nest over the continental of the United States, it's configured a little bit differently, more for uh, severe storm applications and for other uh, convective scale uh, uh, events. Uh, here's one example of uh, representing uh, uh, snow bands off of uh, Lake Michigan and uh, Lake Superior and Lake Huron from last winter. This is something that's often, uh, this, this snow banding is often difficult for a lot of models to pick up on uh, correct, quite correctly. It's difficult to get the bands instead of us with the correct precipitation. So the plot up here on the upper, uh, up 
upper left-hand corner you've already seen, but the plots on the right uh, are similar plots from our, uh, our version of the model. Uh, these are our track forecast skills. Uh, upper, on the upper right-hand corner here, you see uh, hurricane lane forecast. And you can see that the European Center certainly does an excellent job on the per first few days. Is, uh, you can see that uh, for the for the real for the real time SE three GFS is using a native data simulation cycle that does as well as the European Center. In fact, I should be that for the first couple of days. If you take a look at the uh, our what we call our SE GFS, in particular the twenty eighteen version here in the green, we're still using the operational GFS initial conditions with this, but we've been able to upgrade the model. We're still upgrading this model. We're going a little bit beyond what uh, EMC is using right now, and that uh, we're actually getting. Excellent track skill uh, out beyond 96 hours, so 120 hours, we're beating the uh, European Center as well, using, this, uh, using older data simulation but an upgraded uh, physics. And then on the whole for the uh, 2018 season, the European Center is doing a, obviously a very good job, but the, uh, our, new, uh, our new version of the uh, RFP GFS is improving upon the uh, it's improving upon the operational GFS, especially at longer time ranges for the effect of the initial conditions. So this really shows you two sides of the same coin. What you can get by improving the uh, improving the initial conditions using the native data simulation cycle, and this other one shows you what you can do by improving the model physics stuff further. And uh, the other the other one is the uh, uh, hurricane intensity. And it's something that global models typically don't do a great job with. That we rely on more models more like H1. But uh, in the 2017 version of our SDGSS. That our intensity skills gain an approach that of the uh, H1, which is a pretty defining result because H1 runs at two corner resolution and we're running at 13 corner resolution. And then this season, uh, through the end of August, we're actually able to uh, do, we're actually able to meet H1 with our new version of the 13 corner model, which is a pretty, really pretty defining result. This is the, uh, the this is some results from, uh, uh, NASA's uh, geosystem, mm -hmm. you may actually see some of this in the news on our popular website. They have a much better production budget than the uh, geosystem. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. Let me show some examples of what, what uh, some of the things that have to be based model does. The, the Goddard the Geos model is, very, is a very powerful system for doing a lot of data simulation uh, research, as well as uh, research into uh, atmospheric composition. And then this is the last application. This is the uh, Diamond Project. This is a project in which we are participating with a number of different uh, international, global, uh, convective scale model designers. And uh, this is a, uh, what we're basically doing is for two S2S runs at global convective scale resolutions on a longer time scale. This is kind of like a combination of weather and climate, where we're not just predicting things, we're also trying to think of some of the climate characteristics of an extended uh, Run. This is a quite extensive run, but this shows what could be possible in the, in the near future. So, a little bit about today's uh, tutorial session after I give you an in, in, introduction on SE3. So, uh, there's two parts here. The first part is describing the uh, science and algorithms in uh, SE3. I'll describe what a finite volume method is. I'll get into some of the uh, numerical algorithms and talk about how the, how the core is uh, designed. And then part two, if we have time, if, uh, time for minutes, I'll discuss uh, some of the practice variants of uh, using these models, getting into some of the nameless options, configuration, and so on. Um, unfortunately, I, yeah, I, my, my amount of time is limited here, and it's quite a, uh, it's a dynamic core, it's quite a large thing, so there's not a whole, and there's not enough time for a complete description of algorithms code based configuration. However, there is a significant amount of published literature that does get quite deeply into the uh, motivations and design of the solver. So, well, uh, I, I do recommend if you want to learn more, then, try, then sit down and start to really read and start to think about some of the uh, published articles. And that gets you a long way towards understanding uh, SD3. And one of the things I also do recommend is uh, if you really want to get into it, then there's no substitute actually uh, sitting down and working with it. Uh, there's the same mathematicians like to add that mathematics is not a spectator sport. And to me, modeling is not a spectator sport either. Okay, and here's most of the references. Okay. So, so a little bit about uh, finite volume thinking, which is a little bit different from what people are traditionally talking about when it comes to uh, numerical methods in, uh, in uh, atmospheric science. So finite volumes, as I mentioned, it's a little bit different than the uh, spectral or the uh, finite, finite distancing uh, methodologies that, are, that have been common in the past. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> so, um, the traditionally models that tend to represent all the variables as grid point values at a certain grid point, or as an expansion of some function space. And instead of, in MP3, we take all variables are some sort of mean value over some air, over either some volume or kind of volume in 3D, or over a phase of a grid cell. And this is powerful because then it allows us to start thinking about things in terms of uh, volumes, in terms of fluxes. And from then we can use the integral, integral theorems uh, of uh, a vector calculus to go between the uh, differential forms of the equations, the differential wave equations, the math continuity equations, and so on. And we can express them in a, we can express them in a natural discretized form by integrating over our finite volumes. And this is a lot of big advantages. One of the, one of, one of the things uh, that's most appealing from the aesthetic standpoint is that we can represent virtually everything as some sort of a flux or as forces on one grid cell into the other. So this allows us to, make, to represent everything in a very consistent manner. Everything is, everything in a flux, we can use the same algorithms as well for those fluxes in, in, in every upper, in every, uh, every context. Which allows things to be very consistent, allows things to flow together naturally. Uh, another, one of the more practical advantages of the finite volume method is that mass conservation was, was sort of down to rounding here. That, that when you're computing the flux out of one grid cell, you know it goes into the next grid cell. Uh, some things are a little bit more, uh, a little more specific to SD3, we use, uh, the, we use a grid scattering called the CD grid. And this has a lot of big advantages. One is that it maintains a vorticity that allows you to compute vorticity exactly, which is very important for a lot of geophysical flows. But we also go a step further and we integrate a procedure to allow us to be able to compute the divergence of the fluxes very accurately. Uh, Mimetic, or more that I mentioned earlier, is that uh, the finite volume methodology allows you to recover some of the uh, physical principles that govern how these things are set up in the first place. So, remember, the Euler equation aren't just some equation that Euler wrote, wrote down. It's actually an expression of Newton's laws that originally applied to finite volumes in space. Uh, one, one, thing, one other nice thing about finite volume uh, thinking, and when you start expecting everything as fluxes, and in particular in terms of upwind computers fluxes, is that they preserve causality. And this is this important physical law that things proceed for, that things have a cause and effect to some extent. To make that a little bit more mathematic, uh, a little bit more mathematical, what it does is that solutions are following these characteristics of the flow, right? that essentially have downstream what we call some say downstream wave propagation flow. And this is natural from the way of the uh, Euler equation. And finally, the uh, non hydrostatic component is fully compressible so that the calculation is uh, horizontally local and we don't have to evaluate global operators to be able to uh, integrate our solution, which is, uh, makes the model a lot more scalable than if you were constrained to have to do a global operation in each country, like an analytic solver. So let's uh, derive a basic planet volume. So let's start here. We have our finite volume here, a blue, uh, blue cube, you can see this is a three-dimensional cube. And it has some, uh, the mean, it has some, uh, distribution of some tracer in it, call it Q. Q in this case is the mass of the tracer in the grid cell. It's the product of the density of the tracer times the, uh, times the mass of the, uh, or excuse me, the specific humidity of this tracer times the, uh, mass of air that's in this grid cell. And uh, you have some sort of uh, winds passing through the screen cell. You have a new direction and a new direction. So we can write down the uh, continuity equation for mass in the screen cell. Uh, this is the differential equation, okay, so it applies every grid point. And we could conceivably solve this over our grid cell if we knew the exact distribution of Q at the initial time, but we don't know this. We don't necessarily know the subject distribution of Q. All we know is that there's some average value of Q within that grid cell. So what we can then do is that we can integrate this grid cell in, over the entire we can integrate over this entire grid cell. And on the right hand side, that would give us just the uh time rate change of the average value in that grid cell. But on the left hand side, we get the uh interval of the of a uh, divergence. So that allows us to use uh, the divergence theorem to come up with this uh come up with this uh line integral or surface integral, if you want to call that properly surface integral that uh, applies to what goes through the boundaries of the grid cell. So we, take, so we want to use one uh, integral theorem here. Uh, second of all is that we can then use the uh, fundamental theorem of calculus and integrate over one whole time step to, uh, to go from the 
timeline change over that over that pretty step to the difference in the values of the beginning and the end. Nothing nothing particularly new here. This is calculus one stuff. But this is uh, actually the kind of fundamental and overlooked part of uh, finding volume numerics is that the discretization automatically gets you the time step as well. And then we okay. Then what we do is we integrate the uh, we integrate the right hand side. I'm sorry, I should say right hand side, not left hand side of the uh, of the of the uh, the, the uh, fluxes over one time step. And then we can break that down across each one of the faces of the grid cell to get the fluxes through each one of those grid cells, and then average that over a time step. And that's a that's another little little subtle thing I'll come back to later, but. We now have the whole thing. We can put together our discretized planning volume method that says that our the the tendency of the uh, the tendency of this this mass in the spring cell is equal to the time to the the amount of mass passing through the edge, edges of the grid cell, the amount passing in minus the amount passing out over a time step. And uh, frankly, the when we put it that way, it's actually. Uh, it's actually a little bit obvious. The amount of change in mass in the grid cell should equal the amount going in in front minus the amount going out. But it's not always clear that that's the case from the original uh, differential equation. Uh, but in this case, in the, over the course of this, we've gone to something that we can solve numerically that we have over a uh, grid cell and over a time step. So the question then becomes, how do we go from this form and then evaluate the fluxes and evaluate them over that time step? So that's when the second part of finding volume taking comes in. This is the uh, this is the uh, piecewise parabolic method, and this is the method that we're going to use to, you know, to evaluate uh, to compute to compute the fluxes themselves to figure out how much is going through each uh, grid cell. And the piecewise parabolic method, often called PDM, P PPM, this is a very famous method in uh, computational fluid dynamics. It was originally devised by uh, Phil Colella and uh, and uh, unfortunately I forget the person. Uh, but anyway, a Phil Colella, who's still at uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, this is an extension of the uh, method originally derived by uh, uh, Graham Van Leer, uh, Professor Emeritus at the University of Michigan, which was a piecewise linear method. And that method itself was an extension of the method of, uh, of uh, Sergei Godunov, who was a uh, who was an aeronautical engineer in uh, Russia. He's still actually uh, he's still he's still around. He still lives in Russia. Uh, this is all basically a development of the, a simple finite volume scheme that basically thought that you can integrate the flux going through the boundaries of each cell wall by applying some sort of approximation to the uh, to the distribution of mass in each spring cell and then integrating that at to uh, get the flux. So what we've done here is we've taken the you can see the uh, grid here down in the state gray line. And you can see the cell mean values in the blue dots. And what we can then do is we can apply a uh, polynomial to that, in this case a, uh, a, a uh, parabola to each grid cell. And if we then assume that the, if we then imp impose a, a uniform wind speed here, in this case you know, coming from the left, we can then say, okay, we know how much mass from each one of these grid cells is going to pass through into the next grid cell during the next time step. So we simply calculate that amount by u times uh, times delta t, the amount that's going to pass through one time step. And from that, you then have your fluxes. So this is a flux going to this from from this grid cell to this grid cell. This is a flux going from this grid cell to this grid cell. This one into this one, this one into this one. Okay. And from that, then you can then compute. Okay, I know how much the mass is going to change in each one of these grid cells. In this grid cell, there's more flowing out of it than into it. So this amount is going to decrease over the next time step. In this grid cell, there's more flowing into it than out of it, so this mass is going to increase. And once again, it's kind of a simple idea. Um, the mathematics is a little bit more involved, but the simple idea is very physically motivated to figure out how exactly the solution is evolving over time. Uh, nearest neighbor? Not, ne not necessarily nearest neighbor. So that would be. Uh, Something more akin to the uh, first order method of uh, Godinov. The idea here is, uh, if you want to get in a, bit, a little bit of the mathematics, you can form a parabola by essentially fitting it to uh, this grid cell and some of the adjacent grid cells. It eventually turns out that the parabola of this grid cell depends on the values of this, 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 this grid cell. So it's not just 
And that's just for your standard uh, little bit of wider Essentially, yeah, yeah. It's a little bit different from a from a cubic spline. Uh, the, the the idea is uh, similar. So piecewise piece like set of uh piece like set of uh block time. Okay, so okay, so we chose the as you mentioned, the parabola that we chose is one that fits the data most closely to the highest order of solutions. So formally, yeah, it's, it's a fourth order solution if the delta x is a constant or actually a uniform group. Well, we can go beyond, quite a bit beyond that. This is the true power of uh, the piecewise parabolic method is that there's a lot of freedom in choosing these parabolas. Um, so we chose them before so that they be the most accurate so that they be continuous, but they don't have to be that they don't have to be complete parallel, so they don't have to be continuous. And in particular, uh, in particular, you can actually think about what might happen is that you have too much flux coming out of the grid cell. If there's so much flux that passes out of the grid cell on time steps that the values become negative, there's too much flux. And thereby you can change the parabolas so that when you're integrating them, there's they don't yeah, the amount of flux is not enough to evacuate that grid cell. Grid cell. So that would be create what's called a uh, positive definite method. And in fact, you can go beyond that. You don't have to just create a positive definite method. You can create a method that will limit those parabolas to uh, make sure that you never create new extrema in your field just by uh, doing scalar reduction. Scalar reduction, the correct solution is always to preserve the shape of that propagating solution. And, uh, and that's, that's another kind of physical thing. That you shouldn't, in the absence of uh, convergence or forcing, you shouldn't expect a new maximum or minimum to appear in a uh, passive tracer field. Um, what you can then do by a so you can change the parabola to enforce these qualities of the flow, or you can simply use it to eliminate uh, undesirable grid scale noise in the solution. So uh, the quote here on the, on the, on the right this is somebody who does a lot of blogging on uh, CSC based issues. And uh, I, I kind of like this because I'm a, I'm a baker. I, I had a reputation making chocolate chip cookies and candies for uh, people getting uh, a challenge for people going up to the final doctor of the uh, But the, the analogy is with the uh, standard whole house chocolate chip cookie recipe. If you follow the Russians, you get a very, very nice cookie. It's not a hard to make. But you can make minor modifications to it and make, and, and, and make something that could be quite a bit better. In fact, change the chocolate chip and then add something. You can add different amounts of sugar or butter. Uh, you can different sizes or so on. Uh, it's kind of analogous to the piece of parabolic method. There's a lot you can do with these uh, parabolas. And indeed, one of the major things that SJ does with me with all that three is to keep changing these uh, limiting uh, criteria. So there's a lot you can do with that. In fact, you can even make the solution steeper if you do want to, if you want to uh, try to avoid damping your solution too much. Okay. So, one good example of showing some of the benefits of, uh, of the piecewise parabolic method is uh, in this plot right here. So this shows four methods in which, uh, four different injection schemes in which a uh, spike here, a discontinuous spike, was injected around a, a domain uh, five times. And we want to see the happen in a solution as it was uh, integrated. And of course, the exact solution should be maintain that, uh, maintain this contact profile forever. But no, obviously, we don't, we don't have any perfect injection schemes. So the question is, how can you, uh, yeah, so how well these schemes do? And here's four schemes. These are all formally exactly the same order of accuracy. These are all fourth order of accuracy. But if you can take a look at some of these solutions, you can think to yourself whether some of these solutions are better than others. So, for example, this fourth order, the fourth order solution here, this is not only as accurate as the others, but does this look like a very good solution to anybody? I mean, if you pass this to like a, like a, a card microphysics package, it looks a little strange. Uh, there are methods that do a better job. There's a traditional kind of Lagrangian method, which is actually a pretty big, which is a very big advance in, uh, induction schemes and in, uh, dynamics back in the day. Uh, it has a host of advantages that you can really take a very long time step. Uh, but it still has some of the issues that, uh, uh that of, uh, overshoots and undershoots. It's not as severe as, uh, the fourth order of center difference in the You still see some undershoots. There are ways to enforce modulation in some of the Lagrangian schemes. Uh, when you take a look at the uh, piecewise carbonic method, you can see uh, that the most strictly monotone method, however, maintains the shape of this uh, very, very well. Uh, but what is the disadvantage of a monotone method? 
is that they tend to be diffusive for things that are well dissolved. If you have like a smooth, uh, smooth peak, it tends to want to diffuse that quite a bit. So one is alternative to use a strictly positive reference scheme, in which you still avoid your undershoots, you still avoid your negative values, you still maintain the shape very well. Uh, it's less diffusive, but you also don't, it's also not quite as, mon as monotone as a monotone method. You still feel a bit of uh, variation here near a uh, steep, uh, near a steep discontinuity. And uh, this, is, uh, one of the, this is one of the things about people who do about oh, okay, this is one of the things that uh, can get you if you are deriving numerical methods. You can show formally that it's a very accurate method, but these accuracy analyses they're all based on continuous sinusoid norms. And uh, people remember their PDEs class is that if you try to do a Fourier analysis on a discontinuous uh, solution like this, you get get oscillations. You get you, that can actually get worse if you go to increasingly higher uh, numbers of Fourier games. And then there's a similar story here, is that uh, if you try to apply a fourth of this, uh, the traditional accuracy analysis to a solution like this, it wouldn't give you a very useful answer. And indeed, the analyses don't show you really what a numerical method would do to a uh, spike of this. So, all in all, all in all, a highly accurate method can be very good for a lot of purposes, but you still need to think about what exactly you're using your uh, scheme for. Okay, so that's uh, basically the finite volume methods. Um, but, yeah, everybody doing okay? Anybody have any questions? Are they going to? Oh, yes. So, you talked about all of the benefits of the scheme. Um, so, you talked about all of the benefits of the scheme. Uh, one deficiency with a lot of finite volume schemes is that they do tend to, is that they are more expensive. Um, one of the advantages of something that's a, like a yeah, second order standard difference is that it's blazingly fast. Like you can compute a derivative using these two points. And indeed, this is one of the big advantages that the uh, NMM and NMMB solvers had is that they were simple finite difference schemes, so they ran like blazingly fast. And indeed, they they are actually faster than uh, FP3. <coughs> Well, but one of the things that SJ has spent a lot of time in his career is making these finite volume methods be as efficient as possible. And uh, that does take a lot of uh, clever thinking, in particular, not just how you're, how you're formulating your problem, how you're, you're formulating your operators to be as efficient as possible, like right? there's parts of the code that are basically unrecognizable because it's not combined in that. Uh, but there's also questions of how are you going to put things together to make sure that your finite volume methodology not only is introducing, not only make sure that it's not introducing instability, but also make sure that you're not doing things that slow it down. And I'll discuss a few of those things that make uh, SE3 quite an efficient model. Another, another problem with, uh, in, about with finite volume things is that if you just use monotone methods without, uh, without thinking about them too much, they can be, they can be more diffusive. And another one of the things that we've done with that has been done a lot of work in an FP3 is to be able to use the power of the finite volume schemes without incurring these penalties of uh, diffusivity. So, in particular, uh, one thing, a lot of, there's been a lot of earlier finite volumes and a lot of these kind of vertical Lagrangian schemes that use very low order methods, and those can be extremely diffusive. So that may be some of where, uh, this could lead to, this could lead to really losing a lot when you're trying to, trying to gain the benefits of finite volume. And this is actually a good point to make uh, when, whenever you're uh, discussing uh, any new numerical scheme, is that you can, we, we can say something that, well, it has this benefit, this benefit, this benefit, this benefit. And indeed, I've shown you a lot of, a lot of nice buzzwords involving numerical methods. But uh, ultimately, it all depends on how much, how well they're, how well they're put together in the end. You can have two great numerical schemes that you're putting into a model, but if they can fit with one another so they can't last, so they basically wipe out each other's advantages, then there's no real point. And this is really where the development of a bank or anything in a model comes in, is that it's ultimately you're sitting down and choosing things that, you, that have the good properties. You want to put them together in a way to accentuate their strengths and to try to mitigate their weaknesses and make it all work together as a complete model, not just as a little bit of a nice little bit. So, thank you. That's actually an excellent question. Okay. Has the finite volume score been applied to other Oh yes, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, 
Oh, yes. Yeah, actually, that, some of the old GPL models were uh, box-type models, which is kind of a simplified uh, version of a uh, finite volume methodology. Yeah. Oh, oh yes, and the Cox model, actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, yeah the Cox finite model, it used some uh, finite volume things to get it. And Mom has always had some uh, finite volume methodology in it. Uh, and there's been other, uh, yeah, like the great, in the great ranks, they use, I think it's called SDM, which is a finite volume model. Um, there's finite volume uh, ice models, I know. Um, and that's mentioned, uh, finite volume methodology, I originally came from uh, computational fluid dynamics. Um, so, indeed, that's uh, actually got shaped backgrounds. I've used them not much here. Yeah. Okay, so this is actually something that's very, uh, actually very widely used in a lot of engineering disciplines. In fact, uh, is, this is all the broad, finite volume methodology is mostly derived by engineers and not, not mathematicians. <laughs> Which it kind of caused a little bit of tension between these two. I, I think that if somebody has a very strong background in, in mathematics and they have very strong, I have very high opinion of people using mathematics. Still, right? I don't, I don't intend that as a, as a Okay. So, moving towards uh, what exactly is going on here. So, the Lennon Roots scheme uh, from uh, published in 1986 and was uh, running prior, prior to that. This is the, uh, this is essentially the backbone of the entire, uh, finite volume, uh, dynamic core. And the Linden Rood, Linden Rood scheme, this is a way of taking one dimensional operators, uh, one dimensional PPM or band meter operators, and then putting them together in a reverse engineered way so that you can use this one dimensional operator to get a fully two dimensional scheme by canceling out the, uh, leading, uh, uh leading splitting term. So this is not a perf this is not a one this is an approximation to a two dimensional scheme, but it gives you many of the benefits of having a fully two dimensional scheme. So a little bit about all the uh, squiggles going on here. So Q is here, this is your uh, tracer field, this is your tracer mixing or uh excuse the good humidity to say. And then pi here is the mass, uh the air mass in that grid in a grid cell. Uh and then you see a number of different uh, operators here. Um so in particular, you see uh, a couple of lowercase operators here, F and Q, actually F and G. Yeah. Um, so those are uh, those are one form of uh, the divergences of fluxes, and, and in particular, those are the adductive forms of fluxes, which are non-conservative. We call these the uh, inner operators because they're inside the operators of the capital F and the capital G, and those are the flux form PPM, or the right divergences of the flux form operators. Flux form operators, which are conservative. So what we do is that, if in so what the whole thing that works is that you first call these inner operators, the adductive form operators, with the uh, original flux, or the original values of, of the tracers. You then add, uh, you get that, you take half of that, you add in the uh, original trace, and then you pass that into the flux form operators, take the divergence of those, and that gives you the advanced field. It sounds a little convoluted. However, this whole process, this allow, this not only ensures mass conservation because the stuff that's actually being used to advance the solution is uh, is, con is still a conservative flux form, but also this form cancels the leading order deformation error in the uh, solution. And this is what allows you to to say that this isn't just a dimensionally split method. This is a fully two dimensional method for canceling out the leading order splitting term from using one dimensional property. And then it only gives you a more accurate solution, but that also gives us this great advantage that the current number restriction is independent in both directions. So that if you had, like, if you're running as just a uh, dimensionally split scheme, your uh, current number restriction would be the sum of the two directional current numbers. So current numbers like the two CFL conditions, U times uh, W T over W X is what the form. <coughs> And in, uh, in FD3, it's not the sum of the operators, it's sort of the one of the, just the weaker condition that in both directions the current number needs to be less than one. And this is a rather stronger uh, criterion that not only, uh, it not only uh, allows us to take a longer time step, but also makes it easier for doing our adaptive time stepping that we do in the uh, creature regression. Uh, one other advantage of this, and remember earlier, I, uh, I, when I was deriving the finite volume method and uh, integrating over time step, that we were able to, uh, prove the, uh, discretization very, the discretization time very simply. It's just the value of time n plus one is equal to the value of n plus one minus this flux divergence. And simply, and that's what we call a forward time operator, that there's only one time level of integration that you need 
instead of taking a couple of different smaller levels of time integration that you would in a, uh, in a sort of iterative scheme. And the, form, the, the linear root scheme that follows that can follows consistently that uh, SD discretization by remaining the forward and time operator. And this is traditionally, this is traditionally arrived for uh, advection schemes. Maybe this is originally a chemical, chemical transport scheme. But uh, you can apply this to a lot of other things as well. And if you formulate your pro the, the Euler equations correctly, then every, nearly everything can be represented as a flux. And in particular, you can represent your the terms of your momentum equation, the uh, vorticity and the kinetic energy terms. They can be expressed in terms of uh, scalar fluxes as well. So, and this is really uh, this is a really powerful thing. A lot of not only remain consistent when we're applying, uh, when we're trying to take to advance all the equations using the same method to advance the, uh, or a very similar method when you're advancing the momentum equation as you are for the, uh, say, the uh, mass equation or thermodynamics. Uh, but it allows us to be able to repeat one operator, uh, one, the use of one operator repeatedly for a number of, for all of our different fields. And one thing I do want to mention is that this is going to get into our uh, discussion with Lagrange and Cardinal. And, uh, is that this is only a two dimensional method right here. You can write a linear root scheme in three dimensions, but it becomes very complicated and very expensive. It turns out that if you use a slightly Lagrangian work requirement in which flow, the flow is constrained to be along the clonable surfaces in the flow, in the flow, that you only need to compute the two-dimensional advection. And furthermore, this means that that deformation of the surfaces is also going to perform the uh, vertical advection in a means that I'll show you uh, a bit more about later. Okay. A little bit of the Lagrangian dynamics. So, So, so far I've been discussing uh, adduction schemes. And now we want to, we want to, the thing about adduction schemes is that adduction is kind of a solved problem. Uh, everybody in the dog has an adduction scheme. I have one. I wrote a paper on an adduction scheme and that didn't come to their product. So, um, so, the real question is in modeling is that, okay, what do you do beyond by an adduction scheme? In particular, what dynamics can you do? And this is really where uh, some of the, the advantages of uh, epi creative so, we're introducing what we call a Lagrangian dynamics. And if you remember some of your dynamics classes, uh, remember the Euler equations are the primitive equations. They can be written in two ways. They can be written in a uh, Eulerian framework, which fixed at a certain point below the Or they can be written in a Lagrangian form, which is uh, a flow following form, which is awesome, which has a lot of simplifying features, although it then becomes difficult to use in checking out a bunch of points and details. Well, you can. You're not constrained to use one or the other. What you can do is you can write the equations of motion as a as Eulerian in the horizontal and then Lagrangian in the vertical. And that's indeed what we do here. Um, so you can see that we're using this uh, Lagrangian-like operator here, here to go from. So we're, we're still expressing the horizontal flux diversions and scalars and in and the horizontal terms of momentum equations. And then we can represent vertical motion uh, implicitly. And uh, by doing this, what this is, we're going to follow the way to flow as the surfaces deform in the vertical. That is, as the flow deforms and the uh, layers expand, they contract, mass converges or diverges into each, each grid cell. The, grid, the layers are going to deform upwards and downwards. <coughs> and uh, the penalty that we exact in doing that is that we need to introduce a new prognostic variable, which we call uh, delta T here, the uh, Layer thickness in terms of pressure in each layer, proportional to the hydrostatic layer thick, pressure thickness, or which is proportional to the mass. Um, but then that allows us to be able to make adva take advantage of this uh, fact that we now know how, we can use it to compute how the layers are forming as time goes on. And if that deformation, that not only allows us to keep flows into a single layer at a time, but also allows us to represent a uh, Vertical, vertical transport of quantities without actually having to explicitly compute it. Okay, so getting into the uh, horizontal uh, momentum, the dynamics of the horizontal momentum equation. So, what we do, what we saw for is our, the, the choice of grid stack we use in this model is the uh, D grid. This is only really a model in the world, the only dynamic form in the world that uses the uh, D grid stack grid. Um, 
And the deep red are the winds that are along each of the cell walls of the thing, of, uh, of the cube. They're along the faces between the sides of the cube here. And they're here in one of the white gray colors. And, uh, you can find a solver just straight from the deep grid, but, uh, if you want to find a volume solver, you need to have the fluxes, which are in the, uh, in the hollow arrows. And that requires knowing the, uh, space normal and time, the space normal and, and time mean fluxes, which means that you need to know the deep grid, the dark, the dark and you could just interpolate them from the C grid and C grid, but then you're losing a lot of information. You're introducing some uh, error when you're doing that. So, and not to mention on top of that, uh, a, a proper finite volume method needs to have time average fluxes, not just time of flux computed in the beginning of the time step. That would be unstable, essentially, Euler's method. So, what we do is we, do, we take it, we use what's called the CD grid solver, in that we that's, we interpolate the, the D grid winds to the C grid, but then we take a half time step forward of those C grid winds. And that then gets us a, uh, that gives us the C grid, the C grid winds at the half time step. It gives us a good approximation of the time sense of winds and thereby the time sense of fluxes over the time step, the average fluxes over the course of the time step. Um, and it's the same, the solver is the same as the D-grid, it's lower order for uh, efficiency. Um, but it doesn't prove, prove quite effective. It eliminates some of the uh, error that you get when you're coupling from the D-grid to C-grid. And this idea actually presages a lot of ideas in uh, uh, computational fluid dynamics. Uh, a lot of times when they, so in the engineering world, they usually don't worry about any of the screen staggered stuff. They always run with the D-grid, a uh, completely unstaggered grid. But what they do is they use a, a technique called a Riemann solver to be able to compute the uh, fluxes in that case. So that's essentially what they use to go from the A grid to the C grid. And we're doing something similar in this case, that we're using a, a method that's just akin to a very simple uh, Riemann solver to go from the D grid wind to getting the time and space between fluxes. And by doing all of this, we not only avoid instability, but we also help to avoid uh, introducing computational modes. So one point I do want to make is that you could use a, a full Riemann solver as used in the computational fluid dynamics world. It turns out most of these things are very expensive because they're designed, designed for very general flows, and in particular you can use them for uh, transonic and supersonic flows. And if we had to take, in, take into account a lot of the difficulties we have supersonic flow, the solver would be, would be a lot more expensive. So why do we want to use the uh, D-grid? Well, one nice thing about the D-grid is that we have the uh, values of the winds along each one of the faces. So we can use Stokes' theorem to integrate around the uh, or integrate around the grid cell and use those space mean fluxes to give you an exact computation of the cell mean vorticity. And vorticity is a, uh, a very important quantity in uh, statistical fluid dynamics. And we're all very well aware that there's a lot of, there's an excellent job governing the uh, planetary scale and synoptic scale circulations. <coughs> that vorticity is a very important determining factor in these circulations, but even at very high resolution, that vortical motions are very important. You see it in uh, tropical cyclones here and here. And of course, uh, the strongest supercell thunderstorms, those are all rotating motions. And indeed, uh, vorticity and eddying is a defining characteristic of a lot of geophysical flows. And why are all these vortices rolling around, and why aren't, why, why, why do we focus on vorticity and not so much divergence? Well, the thing is that vortical motions tend to persist. They are longer-lived than, uh, than, they're typically longer-lived than divergent motions that tend to, tend to flow themselves out pretty quickly. Um, and certainly you can have divergent motions and vortical motions together, but it's really those in, in those cases, it's really vortical motions that are that are really creating the defining features of flow, such as in the supercell thunderstorm. And of course, vortical motions are uh, critical for maintaining general circulation of the atmospheric ocean. In fact, uh, if you take a look at the map of the uh, ocean, you see a lot of small-scale eddies in it, which are the consequence of the fact that the rock field of the ocean is very small. And, and of a couple of systems as well. Uh, so it's really the wind stress curl that governs how the uh, how the atmosphere forces in the ocean of course uh upwell repeatedly in a uh tropical cycle. Okay. So the uh, momentum equation. So 
Uh, let's, let's talk a little bit about this because it's one of the more uh, complicated parts of the uh, of, of uh, FP3 is how to calculate things problems. Uh, this version of the momentum equation, you can write the momentum equation in a couple of different forms. One is one is in the uh, momentum form, which has the uh, traditional gradient of the individual wind winds in it. And we can follow that, but if you're in that case you're computing the uh, advection of the wind vectors themselves. And that means you're not just advecting the components, but also the uh, unit vectors themselves, which becomes quite which uh, adds a lot of expense to your uh, solution if you're computing a lot of measurement. What you can do instead is you can express the governing equation in the uh, in this form, it's called the uh, vector invariant uh, form of the equation. And in that form, we express the momentum vector as a term as a term in terms of volume of scalars, the x and vorticity and the uh, kinetic energy. And uh, in that case, you're vecting scalars instead of vectors, and the scalars are well, they're the same in every point of them. They're quite a bit easier to uh, vector in this case. So we can. Then to compute the fluxes, we can use, use uh, we can then compute the fluxes of vorticity, and then uh, to do a little bit, so a little bit different for the uh, kind of energy, but it actually turns out to be very similar. I'll describe that in a moment. Uh, as I mentioned, the D grid allows the exact computation of the of vorticity, and this becomes very powerful. In old in previous applications, we were doing uh, uh, motions that are very, uh, very governed by uh, shallow water of vorticity, for instance. Uh, we're injecting the, we're injecting the, we're computing the flux of vorticity to be able to advance the, uh, the deal of advanced momentum equation. But those same fluxes are being used to inject the mass as well. So, we're essentially injecting the, uh, product of the mass and the S of vorticity, which is the shallow water pitch of vorticity, as a passive scalar by itself. And doing the little consistency allows us to preserve the, preserve properties of the field very well. And that's not all. If you go to very high resolution, one of the things that uh, convective scale forecasts worry a lot about is updraft choices, which is a product of uh, vertical velocity, vertical velocity, and vertical vorticity. And what comes the same story is that we can use the same flux scheme that infects the vorticity as we are to affect the uh, vertical velocity. So we're then infecting updraft velocity, updraft velocity as a scale. And this allows to represent updraft velocity very fine scale, in a very fine scale manner. It's very fine scale in our models. It's a very appealing feature for people who use uh, updraft velocity in front of proxies to see here Okay. So I keep mentioning the uh, fluxes of vorticity. Um, and a little bit about how this actually is computed. So in this case, uh, you see this term right here. This term is, it will be the vorticity flux in disguise. It's a little complicated looking, but it's really a flux. Now, when I say it's a flux, usually we're computing the, uh, we're computing, say, we're trying to advance the uh, continuity equation, the mass continuity equation. We're not evaluating with the flux, we're evaluating with the flux divergence, the uh, divergence of the mass going through a uh, certain grid cell. Well, in this case, we're actually uh, computing the flux itself, and that is a density term, it's not the flux divergence. In the erosion direction orthogonal to the uh, wind that's being uh, advanced. And uh, actually, yeah, yeah, and it took me a little while thinking about this to really work it out. But if you sit down and think about how the vorticity is being, uh, or how the vorticity flux works, it's essentially like introducing the uh, cross terms in the momentum flux, the terms like uh, u, uh, u, d, 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 x, x minus d, d, u, d, d, d. U, U, D, U, D, Z, D, X, minus Z, D, Z, D, U, D, D, Y. Yes. I always, I always get those things up. You can think of this like the cross terms in the uh, momentum equation. <coughs> uh, the next step is then, you have this term right here, which is the uh, kinetic energy. And at first glance, it seems like it's pretty easy. This helps if you just you, you compute your kinetic energy like you went into a pressure physics. Well, unfortunately, if you were to do that, you'd start to see a lot of noise in your solution. And this is what's called the uh, Hollingsworth Culver instability. Uh, Hollingsworth is, of course, the uh, founder of the uh, European Center for Medium Range Forecasting. And uh, when they were developing the model using this form of the momentum equations, they were being doubled by instabilities for a while. They're kind of scratching their heads about what was going on here. And it turns out that uh, what was going on is that they were computing the most uh, 
uh, kind of the most trivial computation of uh, kinetic energy. And that was, pre that was inconsistent with the way they were computing the vorticity flux. And that was creating, that was what was creating the instability. If you remember that, the original form of these equations is in the momentum form. We have the U, D, U, D, X, U, D, U, D, U, D, 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 Y, and so on. And these two terms are basically those momentum fluxes split apart into two terms. Physically, what you want to do is you want to represent those with the same, with, with the same method of computing the fluxes. And indeed, if you were to compute this trivially, you can identify it trivially, it would give you something that is inconsistent between the splitting of the two terms. What you want to do is you want to com compute this the same way you're computing the fluxes. And the long story short is that uh, when you go to compute the kinetic energy, you want to compute it in a form that is weighted upstream, that you use not just the value added at that point, but also the, you multiply together the wind at that point, kind of, wind from one at that point, times the value upstream of that. And you can compute that actually using the same flux operator you use the uh, momentum. And you go through that, you get a very stable solution that is, again, more consistent, that, that you're using the same numerical method to compute the vorticity flux as you are with kinetic energy. And you take the, uh, the gradient of that, and you, get, and, uh, you move forward down the step. Well, the two-thirds of the momentum equation, there's also a side divergence standing term that I'll talk about a little bit more later. Um, the third part is the uh, pressure gradient force here. And this is a little bit different because it doesn't immediately look like it's a little bit different. Okay. Okay. We're moving to the best for everybody. Okay. So pressure gradient force. This is one thing that has to be done a little bit differently because you can't necessarily write it as well. But, however, there is a natural finite volume methodology for this. And one thing about the pressure gradient force is that if you compute it the most naive way, you're taking a big, large difference of two nearly identical pressure gradient, pressure, two, you're taking a gradient near, two nearly identical pressure values, which are very big numbers. You have trying to take the small difference of two big numbers, and that's where error can come up. But what we do instead in FD3 is that instead we take a uh, grid style again in this case. This is in the uh, FD plane of the case. And what you can do is you can compute the forces on each face of those grid cells and integrate them in the Ustream theorem again to get a uh, expression for the uh, pressure gradient force in this direction. And here's one, one form of that right there. And uh, this, by doing this, uh, we're, we're able to cancel out a lot of the large differences and not have to actually uh, subtract them annually. We then, and then, instead of computing the pressure gradient force, we can take the difference, we can take a rather larger difference and that gives you a rather more accurate way of computing the uh, pressure gradient force. Is this using the combined CMP Uh Yes, this is all done. Uh, this is the same method is done for both the uh, C grid and the uh, D grid. And, uh, step and four half a time step. The C grid for half, half a time step. <coughs> so, and this method, uh, this method has a number of other advantages as well. Uh, if you, as a part of this, you're computing the uh, force of this grid cell, the pressure force of this grid cell on this grid cell. But by this method, that's equal and opposite to the force of this grid cell on this grid cell, which is, of course, Newton's third law. And by evaluating pressure gradient force in this form, we're getting a very consistent form of the uh, pressure gradient force that recovers the uh, recovers uh, recovers Newton's third law. And in particular, it leads to uh, this, this method itself conserves momentum. The entire equations themselves don't conserve momentum, but the pressure gradient conserves it. And furthermore, because it's more accurate, that you avoid a lot of the noises that are cases that are common in a lot of pressure gradient force evaluations. So this is a test of uh, what's called resting flow over a mountain. The flow over a mountain, the correct solution is that it shouldn't move, but simply because there's errors in a pressure gradient for any pressure gradient force formulation. So you get non-zero acceleration. And uh, a traditional method doing that is up here. This is a rather uh, noisier flow. This is a rather noisy solution. Your domain is eventually going to fill up with uh, noise from the pressure gradient force that we can't have. However, for the uh, finite volume method, you get you, you certainly will still see some errors, but they're rather smaller than, and less noisy than they are in the uh, in the traditional method. And if you continue to more recent days, this is from the uh, 2012 uh, air comparison dynamic cores in large community projects. 
And you can see that uh, in the more modern FD3 solvers, you see the same sort of result. You see some errors in the solution, but you don't see the large fields of numerical noise you might see in other, uh, other, other numerical methods. And this method can be applied to both the uh, or to the hydrostatic and non-hydrostatic components. Uh, and we compute them differently. We compute them separately for one, the values can be a little bit different. But also we, uh, uh, we can compute the uh, hydrostatic pressure gradient force using the log of pressure. And this makes the differences even, this makes, you're going from a medium sized difference of large numbers to a medium sized difference of medium sized. So this makes your computation of pressure, or hydrostatic pressure gradient even more accurate by you computing it separately. You take the log of the hydrostatic pressure and compute the that, and you compute the standard pressure using the non-hydrostatic method. Uh, non-hydrostatic pressure. Okay. Uh, a little bit of a thorny issue. I want to discuss a little bit about uh, numerical diffusion in models. And unfortunately, some people have gotten this sort of idea that numerical diffusion is bad. That is essentially the devil. And, uh, and I've actually gotten this in some of my uh, reviews, reviews from my papers, is that this is, oh, the only reason people use numerical diffusion is to cover up errors in their solving. And this isn't really the reality. The reality is that numerical diffusion is a necessary part of any model that's used for environmental simulation. And indeed, is necessary as a consequence to the way a real fluid works, especially a real turbulent. So, so this, this starts off a little bit of a dog roll that uh, uh, Lewis Fry Richardson, the founder of American Weather Prediction, wrote back in 1922. Uh, it's a play in a uh, kind of poem. Basically, the whole idea is that in, in, a, in any fluid, you're going to start with flows going in at some relatively large scale. The atmosphere, its scale of energy input from, say, Fahrenheit. <coughs> But then we all know that the atmosphere is not full of just ferroclinic mode. It's full of other smaller scale modes as well. And you go down to smaller, smaller scale modes, you down to middle scale, storm scale, micro scale, and then eventually you get down to the molecular scale. And eventually, yeah. And you eventually get to a scale in which the eddies are sufficiently small where the uh, molecular diffusion in uh, in the air is able to damp out those and change the mechanical energy into uh, heat energy. And this process is called the uh, turbulent energy cascade, that you start with larger scale eddies, and that due to a combination of instabilities and nonlinear turbulent interaction, that over time these eddies will transfer their energy down to smaller scale eddies, and then from there to smaller and smaller and smaller scale eddies until you get down to viscosity, and they are dissipate, uh, dissipated kinetic energy the eddies is transferred into. This is a little bit more complicated than very large scale flows because it's an upscale cascade. So this is the basic idea is that you want that energy passes from larger scales down eventually to smaller scales. And then eventually is diffused in the real atmosphere. The problem is, is that in any, in any environmental model, those scales are not resolved. These are the scales of centimeters to millimeters. And in any model of any decent size, any, compu any computer conceivable within my lifetime. I don't think we're ever going to get the scales which are going to be able to simulate uh, dissonance scales and have a good environmental scale simulation. Uh, engineering flows can simulate those dissonance scales, but then they're simulating the not the scope space and not the oil regions. So what happens is that we have this turbulent cascade, so energy is moving to smaller and smaller scales, but you can only represent scales of a finite size on, in, on the mesh of your model. And if you don't have a way of getting rid of that, then that energy is going to keep accumulating in those grid scales until it gets larger and larger. The noise scale is going to dominate the solution and eventually it's going to grow into a crash if you run a long time. The way that we take care of that is we use introduce numerical diffusion. We introduce artificial diffusion to remove those grid scale modes. That, we, that numerical diffusion, as clumsy as it can be sometimes, as undesirable as it can be at other times, it is representing an unresolved process. The fact that those grid scale, that there is no grid scale of the atmosphere, the real atmosphere, that energy will con energy should be continuing to pass smaller and smaller scales. And 
since this is something that cannot be simply represented in column physics, because there's horizontal information that needs to be named out, even though that you're damping out the intrinsic evolution, it has to be part of the dynamical core. That any dynamical core means it has some means of fusion. And if somebody's telling you that their, their model has no fusion in it, then I, uh, I'd, I'd be very careful. I'd be very careful. Uh, there's a number of ways that numerical diffusion comes in in a, in a model. It can come in implicitly uh, through a number of different schemes, like the upwinding scheme that I mentioned earlier, that, or the monstrosity scheme in particular, can be very diffusive. Uh, damping can come in through tight damping time integration schemes or through the branching remapping. But we have to apply explicit diffusion through a number of different means. So the Snagorinsky Lily scheme is a, is a famous example. Uh, Snagorinsky and Lily were originally actually at GFDL where uh, the scheme was formulated. So there's also more, more there's also hyperdiffusion in uh, divergence damping as well. And even if we didn't have the numerical cascade, uh, or the uh, terminal cascade, numerical diffusion would arise through, uh, through in, the, in the operation of any realistic model, simply because uh, well, models are not perfect. And if, even if you had a perfect model, you're still getting imperfect data. So, you, yeah. So basically, even if, even even the best model, even the best model isn't an angel. You'll still get bad. You still get bad data fed into it from the boundary condition conditions. Physics do weird things, and there's always some weird thing that these very complicated models you don't know why you have it. So, in this, those are things indeed you'll need to be able to take care of. And indeed, properly configured numerical diffusion. Can not only not only is it a ne not only is it what you might consider a necessary evil, it can actually improve your solution if you configure your diffusion correctly. And one example of this is the uh, paper Zhao held and Lin, this is the uh, the high rank climate model, in which they did a study of divergence damping in the model. They found that applying more divergence damping got you stronger hurricanes. This is kind of part of what goes against what we might originally think, that more damping may actually make your hurricane weaker. What it does is that any more damping Damped out the small scale modes that were eating up uh, tape and preventing the uh, products from organizing. If you allow, if you damp out the grid scales and allow heptocyclones to at least resolve in the small light uh, uh, fairly well, uh, to evolve without that, they have a lot more, they have, they have a lot more energy in the atmosphere, a lot more tape to uh, tap into to be able to continue to intensify. There's a couple other studies that looked at uh, damping and uh, radius convecting equilibrium studies. And this really interesting study of Pressel, uh, Tekio Schneider's a student, uh, so it might become part of the uh, next, uh, of the Allen Institute's new uh, model. Uh, but what they found is that we were doing LES simulations with a uh, traditional SGS scheme. And they found that numerical diffusion could actually do a better job than a lot of uh, SGS schemes and, uh, for, a number, for a number of different reasons. But they found that a lot of the variance in different SGS schemes can be reproduced simply by changing the amount of numerical diffusion and not having a sudden density at the terminal scheme. So it's, a, it's, a, it's actually a very fascinating paper. And I, I think about it a lot when I start thinking about uh, doing LDS type simulation. <coughs> in FP3, our diffusion is highly configurable to represent the uh, range of applications for this scheme. So you can always choose the right diffusion for your particular, uh, for your particular application. So uh, I've been talking for a little bit over an hour. Does anybody need a break or anything, or are we good? Okay. All right. Uh, I'll take. Uh, I'll, I'll be done this time. Yeah, I'll be fine. Yeah, thank you. <coughs> so uh, okay. So a little bit about uh, implicit damping solver and uh, any upwinding scheme and any finite damping scheme, particularly ones that use large density constraints. Uh, there's going to be some implicit damping. It's impossible to avoid that. Uh, the uh, design of a solver introduces very little computational noise, but we still are going to have noise anyway from the number of solar is for, yeah, it's simply unavoidable. Uh, originally, the way the SD, SD3 and SD were designed was that almost all the diffusion came from implicitly through the uh, monotonicity scheme. And uh, this is actually the way that we still run the climate model to use uh, SD3. All we need to do is add uh, non-existence to the, to the, uh, to the uh, fluxes, 
And from that, we didn't need to use any effect, any additional diffusion to the uh, prognostic, to the to the prognostic, to, to the prognostic variables. And this is a this is kind of a smart diffusion. That it's a what we call a nonlinear diffusion. That the amount of diffusion being added depends on the flow itself. It's not just a linear diffusion coefficient like hyperdiffusion. Uh, and so it's very selective. It won't be applied in regions that are what's called by smooth. Uh, one problem with uh, monotonicity schemes is they tend to be too strongly diffusive for a higher resolution simulation, particularly when you start running into non-hydrostatic uh, effects, which can happen in resolutions as high as, uh, or as low as 25 kilometers of first phase. <coughs> um, so, as a, so monotonicity schemes have a lot of good advantages for coarse resolution simulation, but for higher resolution, they may be uh, simply yeah, too strong of a too strong of a drug. So we apply, uh, so, so instead we can apply, uh, what we call, uh, damping to the scalar fields, sometimes called vorticity damping, because it was originally applied to the, uh, vorticity fields. Um, if we apply, if you use non-monotonic, uh, methods for induction, we can then apply some vorticity damping to the scalar fields. And you apply, now we need to apply a little bit of this in a very high order, so that doesn't affect the low resolved extreme one. Okay. So Oh, okay. I'm sorry. It's not a great microphone. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, okay. So the original idea is that if we wanted to damp the uh, damp the uh, wind fields, you could damp them directly to the uh, to the vectors to the vector winds. So we affect the wind components. So that's a little bit uh, cumbersome. What you can do instead is that in the, uh, remember that in the momentum equation that's where we're using the vector variant equation, we have these scalar fields. We can then advance the uh, vorticity, we can advance the vorticity instead of being used to consider the fluxes. And then to maintain consistency, remember I discussed the consistency between the mass and the uh, peripheral velocity in the uh, vorticity field, we can then apply that same, uh, that same damping to the other fields. So, uh, that maintains consistency. And then allows us to introduce a little bit of diffusion on fields to avoid to avoid noises from the uh, One thing I should point out is that this uh, damping is not applied to sub cycles uh, to the to the uh, trace to the uh, trace reduction to the sub cycle traces. So I'll get into a little bit what that means. And one another nice thing you can do with this is that the kinetic energy is blocked by the damping can be restored as heat because we know exactly how much kinetic energy is lost when we do that damping. And this allows us to improve the uh, conservation of energy in the uh, in the model. This is an important thing that particularly applies for longer term integration. So, one of the ways that we've been able to improve the uh, skill of our 10 uh, day FDGFS forecast is to, do, is to take a look at the energy balance and work on improving that. And that, just by improving the energy balance, we got quite a bit of improvement of skill beyond day five. Okay. Now, we're just dancing with the other sort of damping that we use in the uh, model. And this is a necessary thing. And the reason for this is because the uh, CD grid design, it effectively allows divergent modes to have unhindered by any of the implicit diffusion mechanisms that we have. Um, if you compute the di if you uh, compute, if you're going to go through and you can compute how much uh, diffusion is applied by the uh, fluxes to the divergence, you'll find that it's actually zero. So the, the divergent part of the cascade proceeds to uh, grid scale without any direct diffusion on it. That's still one of the good things. These are representing di divergence very well without, without uh, artificially diffusing it. But once again, we do need to start damping these things out. So to represent the dissipation of the uh, divergence, we then apply a, a scale-selective damping to just the divergence components of the flow. And uh, this has a couple of advantages. Uh, one of the big ones is that uh, when we're applying the stamping, we can apply it at a as high of an order as one. When we get a higher and higher order, that means that it's more scale selective, that it has less and less of an effect on better resolved modes. If you apply second order divergence stamping, that's going to damp out your level almost too much. So we go to fourth order, we go to fifth order, and we also attempt to do some analysis with uh, eighth order uh, divergence stamping. And those seem to be increasingly less diffusive to the uh, resolved scale modes. And an advantage of doing this is that, that since the solver treats divergence and rotation differently, is that then we can damp these two components differently. And this is 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and you play a little bit of original Cuba at the the uh, second element solvers do the, the separation as well. Um, but this is a very nice piece to be able to use in this, uh, in this, uh, in this solver. Okay. So now I want to discuss more about the Lagrange and uh, what it can for you. Okay. And uh, one thing I remember uh, thinking about when I was in grad school and hearing about shallow water dynamics. And the nice thing about shallow water dynamics is that it's, uh, it's got a free surface. It doesn't specify how thick your uh, layer is. <coughs> and it doesn't specify anything about your vertical structure on the fluid either. I mean, it does seem that it's uniform, but for the most part, it's particular teaching to it. But the shallow water layer has a free surface. It has a dissolving bottom pressure depends on how much mass is in the layer. And it implicitly forms a vertical transport of anything that might be flowing along in the shallow water layer. If you have, like, a rock, you can think about, uh, if you have a subcritical flow, that if you have water piling up over that rock, that any, uh, any, anything floating along with those, with that shallow water flow, it's going to flow up with the shallow water flow, and furthermore, it's going to be dispersed out a little bit in that, uh, in, into the, into the, uh, thicker flow over the, uh, over the rock. And then, of course, you can compress back down again when you need that. You can actually see this in the more of, uh, of, uh, shallow water flow as well. Um, but then, uh, one of the ideas, something that kind of occurred to me when I did this is like, well, what if you like derived a model to stack a whole bunch of shallow water flows on top of one another? And actually, it turned out that this is actually what the Lagrangian for performance is: is that it's essentially a bunch of layers that are allowed to uh, to it's allowed to allowed to force on one another in the vertical, but the flow their kind of the flow is constrained within each of those layers. Those layers then deform as the flow evolves. But the flow itself, it stays within that Lagrangian layer. It's basically a Lagrangian way of taking a look at vertical transport, vertical motion in a model. And you can then combine this, as I said earlier, with the uh, Eulerian horizontal treatment. And that fits the structure of our solution. And Lagrangian dynamics is very powerful. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the big things about this is that it allows you to. The only force on the, between the Lagrangian layers is the uh, pressure gradient force. The only direct feeling they have is the pressure gradient force because the flow is constrained to each layer. This allows you to greatly increase the amount of parallelism in your solver. That if you could do it, you to run the most threads, you could integrate the horizontal dynamics for each layer separately on a different thread. And uh, furthermore, as I was getting at earlier, there, the uh, vertical motion in a Lagrangian model, that's all taken care of almost, almost automatically, almost for free, just due to the fact that the layers in a Lagrangian model, they're going to expand uh, either thermally or through mass conversions or through elastic effects. They're going to expand and contract and float up and down. That's going to automatically take care of the vertical motion in each layer. And furthermore, it's going to automatically take whatever traces are in that layer with it. So your vertical transport, your vertical induction is done for free, and it's implicit, which means that you have no uh, quantum number restriction, which is a very important feature, which is actually a very important thing, especially when you have very thin layers that might that might see very strong vertical velocities you're passing over a uh, topographic obstacle. Um, it's also decreasing the amount of, impl of implicit diffusion between the layers. The only implicit diffusion comes in through the uh, reading of the animal steps of the and this often in the past has also improved the uh, surface interaction with PPL. Uh, in particular, you don't have to reduce the order of advection in the vertical when you get down to the uh, bottom, when you get to the, uh, to the lower boundary up here. <coughs> okay, so, uh, I, so, so a lot of this I've already covered, but um, basically the idea is that the flow is well constrained in different layers. The uh, layers themselves then form during the integration. They move up and down. There's no cross-layer flow or diffusion. And uh, as a result, and one consequence of doing the, all this is that to be able to do this, we need to introduce two, var two, la two variables, delta T and delta Z, which are the uh, mass and the depth of each, uh, each layer. And those are treated as prognostic variables, which themselves are injected as if they were as if they were scalars, with additional terms for the hydrostatic distortion of them. Hydrostatic elastic distortion of each uh, vertical layer. Okay, 
And as I mentioned earlier, the uh, vertical abduction is implicit through just through the motion of the place. There's no current number uh, restriction. The, the stability restriction for the Lagrangian requirement is much weaker lip shift continuity equation, which uh, comes down to, in this context, basically being that layers cannot become infinitely thin. The layers, uh, the model can represent very thin layers, but we cannot, we do not allow the layers to become negative, become zero or negative thin. That would apply negative pressure in our models. They do, layers are allowed to become very thin, but we don't need, well, when that happens, the model can still integrate forward. We don't need to do the smaller time step. We don't need to do things like restricting the uh, diabetic feeding to avoid getting too strong vertical, uh, vertical motions. So I mentioned that the layers we formed during the uh, course of the simulation. Um, uh, well, however, we'll still get the most accurate solutions as time goes on, because as the flows deform, they can deform to, be to a quite radical degree. They can get to the point where layers do get very thin, thin, extremely thin, and they can eventually approach zero. Or that if you get situations where the surfaces are so so deformed that the pressure gradient force is uh, computation becomes less accurate. So what we eventually do is we do a vertical remapping, and we do this uh, not every time step, but it's every uh, every so often during our uh, during our short dynamical time. <laughs> and what this does is that this does something very similar to the C shape parabolic method. In fact, it's a little bit more accurate using a uh, cubic spline instead. And uh, what we do is that we uh, we uh, build a subject reconstruction similar to what we did for keeping the for each layer. And then we, in, we integrate those to go back on to remap the layers back on the uh, reference or Eulerian vertical levels. So, this is some of the conservative remapping that I mentioned uh, that I mentioned earlier, and that, a lot, that some other numerical methods use. It's a very accurate. It's conservative. It conserves mass and conserves whatever other quantity that you're remapping. It does introduce some cross-layer diffusion, so it actually becomes more accurate if you use a uh, longer time step. This is kind of one of the paradoxical things of uh, of the Lagrangian method, is that they're actually more accurate when you take a longer time. Uh, and another thing you can do is that since we're doing remapping using the uh, piecewise parabolic method or cubic spline, we can limit those, uh, we can limit the reconstructions to be able to enforce monotonicity again. So you can, once again, use the ideas from the piecewise parabolic method in this uh, context. So moving on to the uh, cube sphere grid, this is what puts the three in uh, FD3, that the earlier versions of the FD used a uh, led to longitude grid. It has a lot of nice features, but uh, the problem is that in a lot of logic grid, you have to convert some meridians of the pole. It's a really restriction time step and requires you to apply a polar filtering. That polar filtering requires a, 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 lot, a lot of data to be exchanged between uh, processors, and that limits how well you can scale your model out to a large number of processors. <laughs> and uh, the actual logic grid did a lot, did a good job for a long time. But it's getting to the point where it needs to pass away. And indeed, a number of different these uh, quasi uniform global grids have emerged. These different things like the perpendicular, Fibonacci grids, and uh, a whole host of other uh, interesting ideas. The cube server grid is actually one of the older ones. It was developed by the French uh, model developers the during back in the 1970s. Basically, what you do is that you project the uh, surface of the sphere onto a cube in the six faces of the cube. And that's, that gives you the gear. Oh. Is somebody there? Yeah. Okay. Uh, what that, you can project the uh, sphere onto a cube, and that gives, you can then draw your grid on each one of the faces of that cube. So you're, you're splitting your spherical domain into six subdomains, or six tiles, is what we call them, and then putting a grid on each one of those. And this gives you a lot of advantages. One is that the, uh, in particular, you go from having a strong polar singularity to to eight inter uh, corner singularities, <coughs> and uh, that allows the grid to remain much more uh, much more uniform as you go from the center of the center of the cube to the edges. That prevents the restriction of the time step, and that doesn't that means you don't have to have a polar filter, so you don't you can scale to a lot more processors. Um, and furthermore, it says that the cube shares a lot of advantages over other uh, other possible global grids. That, oh, pardon me. Yeah, I was going to do it. Why did uh, polar filters 
Okay, so pull a filter. That means you're applying a uh, like a you're you're applying a uh, an operation to an entire latitude band, and uh, that means that if you were to spread that latitude band around a bunch of different processors, that means every time you wanted to do that, you have to get you have to gather data from all those processors, and that gather that's very efficient. That's essentially it's essentially the same as doing a uh, local operation. When you you go into something like the or the Texas I can't the evil grid. You don't even need to apply a four filter. You don't need to do that mobile operation. Okay. Uh, the cube sphere has a lot of advantages over uh, some of the other domains. Uh, one is that the uh, this is the only way you can uh, express a fiber lateral across a uniform domain other than the map line grid. And this allows you to maintain your I efficient IJ indexing and you need to send me the interaction about the other grids do. Uh, and on a cube sphere, since your quadrilateral domain, higher order numerics are equally formulated. It can be difficult to do this on, uh, on some of the text grid. Uh, domain decomposition is four. It is also available to various means of uh, grid assignments for nesting for stretching. Uh, when the cube sphere grid is first being formulated in uh, FT3, they considered several different uh, cube spheres uh, couple, with a couple of different buzzword names. Uh, what I eventually settled on with the mnemonic cube sphere grid. Mnemonic simply means that the coordinates are uh, great circles locally. Um, and uh, this is going to be the most uniform grid. In particular, it has the smallest difference in uh, grid cell between the center and the edges. The difference is only a factor of the square root of two. And uh, also, the, there's the least amount of uh, aspect ratio distortion, a lot less uh, uh, rectangular cells in this uh, grid than some of the others. And this more great uniformity it gives you the best uh, wave propagation across the uh, through the uh, through the corners of the sphere. And since the grid cells aren't so small, that allows you to take a longer time step than if you had a less uniform grid. Now, the disadvantage, however, of the demonic cube sphere is that your coordinate is non orthogonal. You need to take into account that here to divide the small one. And furthermore, you need to do special handling at the uh, edges of the corners to avoid uh, grid. We have a simple means of uh, doing that with all the extrapolation at the uh, edges to the, uh, to the face. So, if you have a non orthogonal grid, you need to start thinking about what exactly, what, how exactly your vector operators are formulated. And in particular, uh, you can express vectors in, the components of vectors in two formats, one called the covariant which are uh, the way that the, uh, the components of which the uh, prognostic variables, prognostic variables. But things like the, uh, the induction operator that use the wind, they use the contravariant components, which is a slightly different way of writing the wind. Um, and not to get too much into the, uh, not to get too much into the uh, differential geometry that defines these two, but one way that you can uh, go between the covariant and contravariant is that you can form what's called the ventric tensor. And you can use this, you can compute this locally every time you convert between the two, uh, two methods. And instead of, and another thing you could do instead is that you could, uh, introduce a whole bunch of different metric terms into your, uh, governing equation. So you could use one form of a lens instead. But that becomes a lot more complicated, computing a lot more terms. Instead, it's a lot more convenient to simply just have the covariant lens and the contravariant lens. And they have the additional advantage is that when you formulate the kinetic energy, if you multiply the covariant win by the contravariant win, that gets you the uh, correct form of kinetic energy. So it's uh, something we do in uh, the mathematical form of how the kinetic energy is made. Remember that it's the, uh, it's the, uh, the kinetic energy. That is a, uh, that, that's a dot product between two vectors. Half the dot product. The magnitude is a dot product between Magnitude, the magnitude of the local wind vibration. So there's no metric tensor in the equation formulation at all? There's a uh, hidden metric tensor that's included in the uh, contravariant. So you could write it two ways that are effectively consistent. That are consistent. One is that you can say you have, you can write a covariant wind times the metric tensor times another covariant wind. Or you can write the covariant wind times the contravariant. And then these are equivalent. The advantage of not right of having the covariant lens or contravariant lens computed separately is that you can reuse them for a number of different purposes, especially things like the uh, kinetic energy. Instead of 
you're computing that multiplication. Okay. <laughs> okay, so I got about 20 more minutes. Okay. So, what about the non hydrostatic solver? So, originally, uh, SD was designed in, as a hydrostatic solver. Um, and you can then, from that, you can diagnose the of there. And things are, things are, things are kind of nice in the, not, in the hydrostatic limit. Uh, things are a little bit more difficult to think about, of course, in the hydrostatic limit. But the solution is, it's relatively easy to, it's relatively easy to come up with a hydrostatic solver. When we went to the non-hydrostatic era, we, want, uh, we wanted to make sure that we maintained the strength of the hydrostatic solver and be able to maintain the good, good larger scale circulation. And as well as the Lagrangian dynamics. But we also want to start increasing the non-hydrostatic currents in the model, things like vertical acceleration. The vertical pressure group, which is elasticity, and all that. Um, so, the way that it's done is that the, the non hydrostatic component was added in as sort of an adjunct to the hydrostatic solver in a way so that it's a truly hydrostatic solver, but that it's done in a way so that it's consistent with the way we did the, not, the hydros whole hydrostatic dynamics. And to that end, we introduced two new variables, W and uh, the later thing itself is V. They're defined as cell mean. So they're unstaggered in the <coughs> And then we can inject those as a scalar quantity, the same way we would inject uh, anything else. And then we can add in the additional uh, terms that include the vertical pressure gradient and the uh, change, the uh, non hydrostatic changes in layer things, so the sound wave terms that govern that. And the way that we do that is that the uh, vertical pressure gradient and the uh, elastic terms, those are all sound wave terms to propagate at the speed of sound, it propagate a lot faster. So, unlike everything else in the model, we don't solve these explicitly. We solve these using the uh, semi implicit solver that can then solve for the vertical pressure gradient and the non hydrostatic pressure pressure increment and the vertical uh, the vertical thickness, the geometric thickness of the heat, all simultaneously and accurately in an implicit form. Uh, this introduces a little bit of dancing to the uh, vertically propagating sound waves. It's but this uh, allows us to, uh, the vertical propagating sound waves, we don't really want this a whole lot of like dancing a little bit, sorry. Um, but it also lets us to remain horizontally in the text for it. So we'll need to have a global solver. Uh, there's a slightly different methodology that exists in the for this vertical Riemann solver, which may be more accurate and very high resolution. But for the most part, we use the summary uh, kind of solver. And simply by introducing this and making a few other model minor changes, the classic hydrostatic algorithm has become fully not hydrostatic. All hydro all Euler places are solved. And furthermore, as I mentioned earlier, you can solve the hydrostatic uh, non hydrostatic pressure gradient force in the horizontal in the same way as you did the uh, hydrostatic pressure gradient force. A little bit about some dynamics in FD3. So one of the things that's been thought about uh, that uh, I know SJ has been thinking a lot about. I know other people have thought a lot about this, but sometimes it's a little bit of neglected. It's how best to include moist sound dynamics in, uh, in a model, particularly not a hydrostatic model. And uh, <clears throat> there's, this, there's excellent literature about this. Uh, Terry Emanuel's book uh, goes through moist sound dynamics very rigorously. And the uh, papers of uh, Thinking Yama and Dr. Spato uh, all discuss this in great detail. Um, but it, there, there is some complications that involve when you want to start doing moist sound uh, one thing we do in, F in FD3 is that the total, we, the prognostic delta P is that air mass, that's total air mass including the mass concurrency. So this means that we automatically introduce the condensate loading term, and which is often difficult to include in other models. Um, but then we also do need to remove those condensates when we do the, when we do the uh, you know, gas off, because the condensates are assumed to have zero bond and they don't obey the uh, gas in the first place. Uh, another uh, quantity is the heat capacity of the total air. And you can simply assume that it has the same heat capacity as dry air, but that's not kind of consistent because you have water vapor, you have the liquid water, you have moist water. They all have different heat capacities. So it's more accurate then and more uh, more powerful to then use the uh, heat capacity as a variable, variable then, something by uh, taking into account all these uh, additional terms, and taking into account the heat capacities of the individual features. Um, and this is the moist thermodynamics of the EDX solver. It becomes even more complicated when you start involving uh, microphysics. 
And unfortunately, this doesn't get as much uh, attention as it should, especially when you're introducing precipitating hydrometeors. How does this move to be transported by a precipitating hydrometeor? And this is a topic that's uh, under, under research right now. Okay. And then the last section that I, I think we'll have time for is the uh, complete uh, FD3 solver. So I've discussed, I've discussed a number of different parts of the solver, and I mentioned earlier that I mentioned earlier that it's not, you can have a whole bunch of nice things in a model, but if you don't put them together the right way, then your advantages and nice things can potentially be lost. So I'll discuss a little bit about how everything fits together and uh, how the whole uh, model is integrated. Okay. So if you remember that virtually everything you have to three is a flux, and uh, the finite volume induction scheme, that is a forward in time two time level scheme. Again, because this is the finite bond visualization. So all those terms are vectored forward in time, march forward using the vector scheme. But, however, we still have the pressure gradient force and we still have some implicit salt. If we had vectored those all to forward in time, the model would be unstable. Okay. So because simply we're, we're simply using Euler's method and this is a state behind migration scheme. So what we do is we do a forward backward scheme. We evaluate the pressure gradient force backwards in time. We uh, advance the everything else in the momentum equation. We advance the uh, the, the dynamically active scalars or a full time step, and then we use those advanced quantities to compute the uh, pressure gradient force and evaluate that backwards in time, and that gets a stable uh, that gives us a stable estimate, a stable evaluation of the pressure gradient force. And we do the same thing for the uh, uh, <coughs> sorry, implicit schemes. It's not only implicit but it's also backwards in time as well. So. And this is what allows the model to remain stable, even though we're simply a true lock time on the time scheme. And uh, again, uh, reason the ground gave vertical coordinate, which allows us to uh, not, not have explicitly taken into account the vertical induction. So, uh, no, in fact, we only save one time level if we want to do an exact, exact restart. So we, when, when I say that we're doing uh, things forward in time, we uh, start with everything everything at one one value at one time, and then we do the forward backwards time stepping. So uh, in fact, actually, I have the uh, whole uh, whole schematic here. So if we start here at time level p sub n, p super n, p of n, uh, we can then advance forward the uh, Lagrangian. The, the advance of Lagrangian stands for the uh, the advance for the uh, Things like the mass field, the temperature field, uh, the uh, vertical velocity, and so on. We advance the effective part forward by one full time step. Uh, we advance the uh, delta v forward, forward as well by the effective part. And then we evaluate, so we advance most of the fields forward by one full time step. We then do a backwards evaluation of the pressure gradient force of the sound waves processing. Uh, Simply by taking those advanced fields and then using those advanced fields to compute the pressure gradient force. So we have the advanced pressure, we have the advanced, uh, we have the advanced temperature field. So that allows us to reconstruct the uh, pressure, well, the pressure fields and the vertical heights. And those advanced values then can then be used to advance the, uh, the momentum fields forward dip, or complete the forward advance of the uh, but at any one time, we don't, once we've gone this whole loop, we don't need to save any prior time information. All this, once we get down to the end, the time TN data is all thrown away. The only thing that's saved is the, uh, the only thing that's saved is the air mass fluxes are accumulated for these uh, some cycle uh, tracers. Okay. So does that make sense? Okay. Okay. So. Uh, and, but anyway, that, that's a kind of a brief overview of how the uh, solver is set up. The so solver has three different levels of integration for it. Uh, the outermost is simply the call to the solver itself, after which we call the send the updated state to the physics, and then the tendencies come back out of the physics and we use that to update the full dynamic field. That's the top level here. The first level inside the dynamical core is uh, the, what we call the remapping kind of stuff. And so we can the title for that. And the first level of that is the call to Lagrangian dynamics, this whole process right here. And after we're done calling, once we get done calling Lagrangian dynamics, 
During the course of those dynamics, we're saving the uh, air mass fluxes for each time step. Now, what we can do with that is we can then advance the tracers, which are not advanced during the intermodal acoustic time step. Those have a, have a weaker current level restriction. You can use a longer time step for those. So, if we just, so we can simply just index the tracers on a longer time step. Now, what that then does, the part of to do is to get results to so that the tracer injection for like the current units, the, 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 uh, the, the tracers for the microphysical scheme and for, say, the chemistry and aerosol transport. Or we inject those using the same air mass that is used to back to the, for the other scalars, the more dynamically active scalars. And this means that the injection of the tracers is then consistent with the injection of all the other dynamic scalars. And that's called a free screen preserving the last thing we do at the end of the remapping is we do our vertical mean mapping. We go back from our deformed Lagrangian coordinate to our Eulerian reference coordinate. And that's what we can then pass off to the uh, physics. And uh, physics, physics requires a certain number of pressure levels to be more accurate. Physics is typically designed for a certain set of work, certain set of vertical levels. The innermost loop, uh, what I originally described, that's what we call the acoustic time step. We can also call that the uh, dynamic step. Well, this is a small time step that injects all of the uh, most of the dynamical processes forward. We call it the acoustic time step because it's also it, it's restricted by the uh, sampling processes that are solved by the uh, vertically vertically implicit and horizontally explicit uh, sampling step. And then this also includes this process also includes the uh, Seagrid step, the first uh, Seagrid step that advances the limbs forward by half time step. That allows us then to compute the uh, time center fluxes that are used for uh, the uh, rest of the set, for the rest of the uh, forward dynamics. Um, I, I, I think it's, mm, I, I think there would be a lot of problems if you try to compute the uh, pressure gradient force in a longer time step. Um, first of all, the, uh, the pressure gradient force, the horizontal pressure gradient force, especially the non hydrostatic part, that controls your sound wave propagation. So that's going to be limited by the, uh, that's going to be limited by the speed of, uh, by, that's going to be limited by the speed at which your sound waves propagate. Now, we're taking a backwards time step of pressure gradient force. But so the horizontal pressure gradient force. So that's not an implicit method the way that we think about it. We want to, we could do a implicit pressure gradient force in the horizontal. But then we sort of have to do uh, a global operation. And that would eliminate a lot of our advantages from the fact that we have a uh, we have a uh, export of solvent. So that we began having to do global operations that our scalability is very restricted and that takes be rather rather inefficient. So it is true that in theory you can run the uh, pressure gradient force on a longer time step. You might take a truly implicit uh, pressure gradient force, but um, in order to remain horizontally explicit, we have to do it on the same time step as the acoustics. And furthermore, uh, I think it would be, I think it's still most consistent to compute the uh, pressure gradient force on the same time step as the uh, rest of the terms of the dynamic equation. So because the uh, pressure gradient force is so closely tied to any uh, horizontally propagating like sound wave driving wave process. But it, it's an interesting idea and it might be it might be something that could be could be worth looking into, but my, my suspicion is that it uh it, it could cause more problems than it So Okay, so I'm referring to uh, things, things such as uh, microphysical or uh, aerosol or chemical uh, species that aren't, don't interact directly with the uh, dynamics. The water vapor? The water vapor, uh, that's, that's, yeah, typically we integrate water vapor on the uh, remapping loop. However, we could conceivably integrate it on the uh, acoustic kind of as well. But we typically integrate it on the, uh, on the longer sub cycle. So you're not carrying water vapor as part of the uh, the actual concentration itself is separate. However, the, uh, when we're integrating the, uh, in the acoustic time step, we're stepping forward the total air mass of each grid cell. Now, one thing that we are doing is that when we, uh, one thing that we are doing is that 
on, on the uh, acoustic time step, we do step forward the mass of the total condensate, which is something that we need to remove when we want it to the uh, not have static pressure increment using the ideal gas law. So, so we, do, we don't yet in, in, integrate the uh, uh, water vapor itself on the uh, on the smaller time step. We do integrate the total air mass in a single variable. Okay, and so the fusion of those quantities takes place Oh, right. Uh, when I say diffusion, that's the uh, vertical, that's a little bit of implicit diffusion that happens when we do the uh, vertical beam mapping. We don't actually apply explicit diffusion to the uh, tracers themselves. That's all handled either by, through the monophysicity constraint or through uh, the diffusion that's on the, uh, that, that's to the uh, fluxes of uh, air mass in the, uh, in the acoustic system. So there's, there's no molecular diffusion, or is that part of the um, if it were to be present, it part of the uh, physics package. Yeah. So, well, we, we run at scales in which the molecular diffusion is going to be very small. Now, when we start to run at, uh, start to do whole atmosphere applications, we start to resolve the ionosphere, then you might want to introduce a package that would include uh, a molecular diffusion. Well, so, if you're doing um, CO2 or methane or turning those molecular species around, hmm. that's the package that's not present. Right. Um, if, we, if we were inducting, we, we didn't really induct CO2 or methane as we do in the uh, Earth system model as part of one of the subcycle tracers. This is another thing we did do. Yeah. But any sort of any, any sort of transformations that are other than just passive deduction, that would be done all in the physics. So, when in your Lagrangian formulation, you have the vertical, how Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. So in the vertical, everything is uh, unstaggered. And uh, we have a couple of uh, techniques that, uh, that, yeah, that uh, you have to have SJ to get more information about. I don't know if it's okay. But, uh, he, he's, got, he's got some pretty neat techniques to reduce the, the amount of error that you have to do. You have an unstaggered distribution of the variables. So, but this, this is unique, I believe, among atmospheric models when we don't stagger in the vertical at all. At least for not every day. All right, so I've got a couple minutes left. Um, so, okay, so I believe I described all of this. Um, okay. And, okay, the last thing I want to discuss is uh, this thing in uh, <coughs> So, uh, after the remapping loop ends, the dynamical state is translating to what the physics needs. And this is dependent on the physics scheme itself. So, for the, uh, say, for the GFS, it's when it expects total air mass, it expects an mass of uh, dry air and water vapor. No condensates. So when we give our dynamical state to the GFS physics, we take out the mass of the condensates and we pass that into the GFS physics. And so we send our state out to the physics and it goes off and does its thing. And then it, re and then it returns uh, a bunch of tendencies. It either returns uh, the tendencies or it re returns updated fields, which is then converted into tendencies. And then what we can do with those tendencies is that we can then apply them, we have a separate routine, an API, that then applies them in a, to our dynamical fields in a manner consistent with the uh, definition of the variable, in particular, our definition of uh, air mass in the, the tracing field. And to make sure that the temperature, the, the temperature tendency, the dynamic heating, is applied consistently, consistently as well. And again, some of this stuff is subtle, but we can actually get quite a bit by uh, making sure it's done very uh, carefully. So when introducing a new physics package, this is one of the big things that we need to really worry about is make sure that this coupling is done correctly. Uh, one, of my, uh, one of my things, so <coughs> tendencies are applied forward in time. So I remember I've been discussing a lot about forward in time integration of solver. And uh, indeed, for physics tendencies, we apply them forward in time as well. Uh, we don't take, like, you don't, like, sub-step the, uh, the application of physics tendencies. We don't, and we don't dribble them in. And uh, we don't have, a, we don't need to limit our uh, diabetic heating either. We take a full diabetic heating and apply that, which is uh, the correct thing to do. Okay. So, uh, uh, with that, um, yeah, unfortunately I'm uh, out of time and not able to get to some of other things, but uh, I, I think I'll stop there. Um, thanks, thanks everybody for, uh, for, for all of you. And thank, thank you for your questions and your attention. So, thank you. <laughs>
Uh, yeah, I can make these slides uh, available. On, they should be available online. If, if they're not, then uh, yeah, send me an uh, email. Uh, Lucas got here at NOAA.com. Okay, thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'll be here until about two o'clock. Okay. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Oh, okay. It's good to meet you. Yeah, good to meet you too. I am. I'm really good friends with Sarah Hoffman. Oh, yes, yeah. She's got a lot of friends, actually. Oh, okay, great. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah. Oh, okay. He has an excellent question, by the way. Oh, yeah. It's yeah, I mean, I don't want to make it seem like that. This is the only way of doing it. There's one way to do it all. And I don't want to do that. Obviously, some of it. I guess the point is that you know that it's, again, you sort of talk about how the SPD, maybe not the SP3 done part of the SPD, but it's pretty extensively. Mm -hmm. And I thought that it said CAM, but I was looking at it. So is CAM an assignment one? Yeah. But it's not SP3. It's not SP3 yet, but it is the part of the SPD. Oh, okay. Yeah. I guess I thought that was a... Well, I'm, I'm not, I'm a work model. I sort of work with a way where. Is there anything specific to specific that you consider when you're developing something like that? I mean, obviously the fact that you're dealing with good cell means instead of good cell. Right. If that seems like a specific thing, it, it, it actually does sometimes. Um, so a lot of times, uh, a lot of things packages they want a, they want layer layer center value, not necessarily layer. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, another thing is they want a lot of uh, layer interface value. And a lot of times you need you need to make sure that we're computing those correctly when giving them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because like a layer layer mean pressure and uh, mean point pressure are two very different. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then there's always issues about, well, what exactly does yeah, the ask you to install? What exactly does the And uh, there, there, there's times when we've had to sit down and think real careful about, well, how can that take what we have and give it to the physics to make it quite All right. Well, I really appreciate it. Thank you. thing that's really respecting our time step is the speed of sound. Um, so um, if you think about it, so the speed of sound is about 360 meters a second. So, um, and I've mentioned on top of that you have a uh, effective wind speed that can be as high as 200 meters a second, right? So if we run a computer on front number, we've got to start with 500 meters a second already. So, yeah, so, um, so let's see here. So if we are running global 13 kilometers, 
Uh, first the time step is 18.75 seconds, right? So, calculator. Um, and then the small sprint cell is about 12 kilometers in, on, on the cube sphere. So, yeah. Yeah, so let's see here. So, we got, so let's see here. So, it'll be about 560 meters a second. 560 meters a second. Times, uh, let's see here, 18 points. Divided by uh, about 1,200, 12, And that gives us a time that we're already about 0.875. So um, if we, let's see here. If we had a way of, like, getting rid of, like, polar night jets, like if we were just, like, very aggressively on the troposphere and damped out the stratosphere a lot, I think we could probably take a longer time step. And indeed, that's something maybe the, uh, the people who are involved in the regional domain probably could take advantage of because I mean like like the hurry of both of them is keep them apart. So <laughs> <laughs> but um, for medium range models or longer, I think that's probably a bad idea. Um, now like low top planet models, maybe that's not such a terrible idea to damp that out, but even then you still have kind of still lose quite a bit. That's kind of what they are walking some point Right. Yeah. Yeah, the pressure gradient force acts, uh, the, the problem with the pressure gradient force, oh, okay, so, the problem with the pressure gradient force isn't that it's computationally expensive. The problem is that you're doing uh, essentially a data transpose. And you, you've gone from doing your component model to being the vertical. And that is what you can really buy. A lot of the expense can